The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. That you chose Drupal because uh, of the um, functionality it gives you and the separation of roles that it gives you. Uh, these are the typical roles you'll see in a, in a um, web development shop. You'll have an architect who does the pulling of the levers, the general outline of the site, the, the vision for the site, as it will. Um, the architect in a Drupal uh, shop has a few more responsibilities since a lot more of the site is in their control or can be in their control. There's a developer who extends the functionality of core Drupal. There's a themer who changes the way it looks. The idea behind um, modules such as views and panels is that we can further separate and abstract out these responsibilities. Views allows you, as an architect, to build displays of the content in your site without consulting a developer. Panels allows you not only to do the same and change where content appears, but it has a layout editor built in. <clears throat> so first, views. Uh, if you have a typical site, you have a lot of content on it. You might have a, you know, 30, 40 pages, or you might have 100 articles, a couple of hundred blog posts. And if you've defined some content types for something a little more esoteric, say, um, uh, spatially sprockets, you've got sprockets of various dimensions and cog number, you need a way to pull that content out and display it in a way that's logical and coherent to the user. What you might see on sites are, you know, tables or lists or grids. What uh, Views does is it gives you the ability to generate those, those uh, Views grids and lists uh, by clicking through a, a stepwise process. Panels is a little harder to explain. Panels is a bit like a hotel concierge in one respect. Uh, what Panels does is when someone makes a request for a page, Panels says, well, OK, who are you? And why are you here? And what kind of permissions do you have? And based on the information that Panels gets, it can customize the page that it delivers. It can show or hide uh, blocks. It can put uh, view panes in different areas. Or it can feed, say, um, the user ID to a view so that it, the content is tailored to them specifically. Now, these are things you can do with blocks, but Panels is a far more flexible way of doing it. And it's less reliant on PHP. There are a lot of things that you would be doing um, with the block system where you'd be writing custom PHP to feed information to your view. Panels, there's point and click, and you're, you'll never fail. Your PHP won't break. So let's create a theoretical content type. I'm assuming you guys know what content types are. Show of hands. Yeah, OK. We're going to create a theoretical content type. Um, I think there was a slide we were going to go to, but I'll come back to it has a title, a body, and three fields. So we have a couple hundred of these on the site. We want to display them. So we're going to create a view. The view doesn't necessarily want to show all of that content. Field one and two is only relevant in a certain context. So we're going to show only the title, body, and field three. All right? We also only want to show content of the content type of interest, which is to say our sprockets. We only want to show the name of the sprocket, a short description, which we're calling body, and say the number of uh, sprockets on the cog. Um, then uh, panels allows us to take that view that we've generated, that display, and place it within a region. Uh, not only does it allow you to place it within a specific region, it allows you to specify whether or not that content shows based on a context supplied to it. Is that everybody with me so far? It's all right if it doesn't make sense. We're going to be going through this three or four times. So here's an example scenario. This is a site we did. Um, this guy does uh, DXF files. They're basically vector files for CNC machines. Uh, he wanted product kits. He wanted to display his light latest product kits on a view on the side of the site. So here you can see a list of uh, three products. This must have been a staging version. Uh, normally, they'd be different, and it would show um, the latest three, the title, a short description of what contained in them, the price, and an add to cart button. So this is actually a view pane. How would we go about creating that? 
Well, first, we create our content type. Oops. We're going to go ahead and create our, uh, this is a content type we're calling product kit. It's actually a product kit created by Ubercard's product kit module. We're just adding a couple of fields to it. One of the things you'll notice is that I named my field. The description is small description, but the name of the machine name for the field is field product kit small description. The reason you want to include the name of the um, content type in the field name will become very apparent later. I'm just calling it out so you'll recall. So we want a title, we want a small description, and we want the cover image that's going to appear on this product. Now we're going to create a view. This is going to be under that Sites Build menu. Uh, and then under Views, Add View. You're going to create a machine name for the view. This is something uh, that uniquely names the view within Drupal. The, the utility of this is that if you ever export the view, you want to make sure that there are no name collisions. This is the unique identifier for that view. The, that is to say, if you create another module that creates a latest products view, you probably don't want to name it latest underscore products. Yeah. Uh, the view description, this is what's going to appear in the list of views, so it makes it easier for you to pick it out of that list. View tag is just a grouping thing. View type, uh, in general, you can ignore this. 99% of the time, you're going to be using Node. If you guys have any database experience, what this is asking you is what base table are you going to be using for the, the um, view. So it's saying, um, are you selecting from the uh, users table, or are you selecting from the files table, from the comments table? Well, in our case, we're looking at product kits, which are nodes, content types. Uh, the product kit content type. With me so far? All right, so the way that we look at a view is that we tend to start at the right-hand side. If by default, views would spit out everything in the system, we don't want that. We want to filter it. We want to limit it only to the, product, the nodes of interest. So we create a filter. When you're within views, you'd click that little plus button and you'd choose uh, whatever you want to filter by. In our case, first and foremost, we want to filter by product kit. We want to make sure that we're only seeing product kits here. If we were to stop there, Drupal would complain. It says, you're not showing any fields. You've got a lot of content coming through, but we're not showing anything. So your next step, you move from right to left, you end up in the field section. Uh, when you click the, the plus section here to add fields to display in your view, you're going to have a long list of items. Uh, I'll explain a little bit about how to help you pull what's relevant out of that long list. But for now, let's focus on the fact that this fields block contains the information that's actually going to appear in your view. So in our case, we were interested in having a cover image. We want the title to appear. We want a, uh, I actually have no idea what that is. I think that's a short description. Sell price, and this is the add to cart form. So you guys recall from earlier, we saw what it was producing. This is the fields that were in there. And you'll recall that we named the field product kit. Now you know which content type. Well, let me back up a little bit. That drop down when you add a field, it looks like this. And there are going to be, you see this scroll bar? There are going to be hundreds of items in that list. Finding out which ones belong to your content type of interest can be a little bit confusing. So the way that you assist yourself in making sure that you get the fields that you want is to name your content type in the machine name for that field. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, another convention to follow that's terribly useful is that you name them from uh, least specific to most specific. So if it were, for example, um, cog lengths, you would say uh, cog, uh, dimension, length. That way, when you sort them, the dimensions were, are close to each other. Make sense? That allows you to more easily select things. So what we would do is, when we were choosing fields, is just check, click the checkbox next to all the ones we were interested in adding. Last, we go to this leftmost column. These are things that allow you to tweak the, the way it, the view looks. Now, all we've talked about so far is what the view is doing. We haven't talked yet about how the view looks. This is where this comes into play. There are two things that you have to focus on. One is the display, and the other are the uh, row style, um, and, well, this style as well. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about displays in a second, but the row style gives you the option to display something as a list, 
So it'll be uh, H LI tags, uh, a table, where it'll actually put your uh, elements in a table, uh, or unformatted, it'll just dump the fields directly as HTML. Which one you choose is dependent upon what your themer asks you to do. Uh, they can also do theme overrides for each of these individual view elements. So um, in speaking about how we can uh, separate the realms of responsibility, if you create this view for your themer, they can come back later and then click this theme information button and it'll tell them the names of the TPL files they need to create to override the display of any of the information on here. So they can override the display of the LI tags, they can override the display of individual fields, etc. They, you can add a CSS class to the whole um, view, and you can add a pager to the bottom of it if there's more than X number of items. So a couple of things I didn't go over yet. Sort criteria, arguments, relationships. We'll talk about that later if we have time. Um, for now, I'm just going to focus on that's how you approach the view system. So the last item on this page is the display. The view can be displayed as a page where it creates an actual page containing your view content, a block where it creates a block that you can place from the blocks page, a uh, views content pane, which is used within panels, or um, there's a couple of others like feed and um, I can't recall the others that you, they're very special use, special case use. So if you choose to display it as a page, it'll ask you for a URL. And so if you type in a URL for it to appear at, from that point forward, you go to that URL, boom, your content's there. Your job is done. What normally we used to take you several hours of back and forth with the developer about what you needed and how to frame it can now be done by you without leaving your chair. Um, displaying it as a block, that gives you the flexibility to display it anywhere on the site. Use the block display um, conditionals. Or you can use blocks within panels. Uh, content panes, these are exclusively for use with panels and they give you the ability to provide context to the view. So that was our view. And you'll recall this is what it generates. All right. I hope you guys will excuse me a second. I'm gonna... I had prepared uh, some um, documentation and a lot of people were asking about Drush earlier, so I'm going to use Drush to create the D6 demo site. Oh, that's right, you can't do that. All right, so let me. So we also asked earlier about the fact that uh, the files are owned by a different user. In this case, they're actually owned by Apache, which is a web user. I'm logged in as myself. So if you wanted to delete these files, you have to log in. At, you have to run sudo as www.data. So that's effectively deleted that. Drush, I've got alias to automatically do the sudo dash u. So there's an example of a Drush command. I just downloaded the Drupal site. You saw I deleted the www folder. It just downloaded Drupal into a folder called Drupal 622. And there's our default install. I'm going to just make it dub, dub, dub. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. So here's our next command. This, um, whoops, I keep forgetting you can't copy. This next command does a site install with the uh, admin name being set to admin, password being set to password, sets the email address, sets the site name as Drupal 6 demo site. 
and then it sets the um, Drupal password for the, or sorry, the MySQL password and MySQL connection string. So let me make sure everything is fine there. And it fall, fails miserably. Oh. Do, 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 do. There, that's done. Now if we were to go to D6 demo, we should have a site up there. Ta-da! So you've got a Drupal salt install created already. Uh, it did, you know, or this one did. The site install did the database install. Oh, you mean, well, no, within MySQL, my server's set up in a way that I create databases on the fly. I, there's a lot of little things that I, the staging server's set up to be as. So, so if you're using Josh, though, you didn't have that, you have to be still in the staging. My admin and Yeah, you can do Drush SQL, and, and if you provide a connection string, you can actually log into SQL from there, or MySQL admin, and just create the table right by the command line. Um, now let me tweak something really quick. On my server, I use uh, virtual document root. So if I don't specify this, I get forbidden errors or 500 errors. All right. Next up, we want to have a couple of modules installed. I did it again. So we're going to go ahead and run Drush and say, install these. We're installing image API, C tools, views, CCK, backup migrate, image field, file field, path auto, image cache. I mean, these are all modules that you normally would have had to go out and download manually. So poof, they're all downloaded. Next step, I want to enable um, several of those modules. Whoops. The dash Y sells it to automatically uh, say yes. This fire PHP you can ignore safely. All right, so now let's go ahead and log into our site. I said it was password, right? Maybe it wasn't password. What was it? I thought it was password. There it goes. Okay. This is admin menu. I installed it on all mine. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. If you don't use it, it's excellent. Yeah. All right. So um, we've just built from scratch a Drupal site, installed several modules, and enabled them, all from the command line, about six or seven lines. We're ready to go. Um, if you had built features that define some of the functionality of the site, you could enable those features, and you'd have an article system in place. You'd have a blog system in place without having to do any configuration at all. So I, I actually stopped there. So I'm going to create a content type. I'm going to call it, come on, I made it angry. Multicolored window panes for reasons that will become clear later. Add a multicolored window pane to the site. We'll leave the title and body. Actually, we'll call it description. And this is one of those irritating things about Drupal. It always promotes things to front page, so it shows up in that slash node view. So you might want to disable that by default, because if somebody visits your site and goes slash node, they're going to see a whole bunch of content you wouldn't necessarily want to present in that way. Um, or you can just alias it out of existence. Also, comments are enabled by default. Doo -doo -doo. All right, so there's our content type. Let's add a couple of fields to it. And while we're at it, before I get there, I'm going to add an image cache preset. And one of the things I do as a best practice by, for um, uh, image cache presets is I name the dimensions and the name of the um, item. That way, if I, I'm trying to find a particular one, I can tell by the glance which one's what. All 
Now you know why I chose 100 by 100. I'm lazy. All right, so let's go ahead and add a field called window pane image. I'm not going to worry too much about details. Uh, width. That's a little thing you can do both at once. Think of any other options that we might add to this. Go ahead and add those now too. So I'll just add a quick drop down um, classification. give us a couple of options, save that. So great, now we've got a content type. Now we have to go through all the hassle of creating about 50 or 60 nodes of it. So hold on just a second. I'll create about 50 of them. No, I'm just kidding. We'll use Drush. <laughs> yeah, I think, whoa. what other option I needed. Uh, well, I don't need the kill. And do I need? Do, 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 do. There, now I've just created 250 of these. Just to show them to you. It lied to me. Am I on the right site? Maybe, maybe I named the content type wrong. Oh, I did. Do, 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 do. There. So you can see we've got a whole bunch of this content now created. And now you can see why I named it multicolored window panes, because uh, in, uh, Devel Generate will ge generate these images for us for use. So that's great. We have uh, 250 of these pieces of content now on the site. Problem is, we'd really like to display it in a reasonable manner. Say on the front page, we want a little listing of the, the top 50 based on when they were up added to the site. So let's go ahead and go ahead and add a view. We're going to call this uh, window. Oops. Window pane lists our views. We're going to leave node as the base type because it is. So now, uh, who can recall what the first step should be? What direction we should start? Yep, start from the right. So we actually have a lot of options available to us in the filter section. We can filter based on comments. You can filter on whether or not the item is sticky, whether or not it's teaser updated, um, whether or not they have access to it. Generally speaking, you want to use node type and published, uh, unless you don't use published on your site. You can just leave it out. And in our case, we don't. So I'm going to. So. Oh, uh, well, I wish it was as simple as saying just go down the list. Some of the descriptions are a little obtuse. The, um, 
the easy thing for me to say is if you don't know what it is, you probably don't need it. <laughs> and if you know what you, uh, no, this is your documentation right here. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, well, if you ask yourself, you know, what is it I want to filter on? The, the, your good bet that it's going to match what your description is. Because, I mean, for example, the one we're using, I want to filter on the type of node. Well, there it is, type of node. Okay. So, um, yeah, you'll want to go down this list. Now, it is grouped. Like, um, we know that the, the type is related to the node, so we can filter it there, and we have much less to look at. But yeah, it's trial and error. Generally speaking, though, filters, if you know what you're looking for, it'll be easy to find. If you don't, you don't need to worry about it. All right, so. Oh, yeah, you can select multiples. In fact, I'm going to go back later and do that. All right, so first, we want to filter by a node type. We only want to show nodes of type multicolored window panes. Now, when I hit this, Drupal's going to complain. It uses fields, but they're none defined. That is to say, this content type has fields, but we're not showing any. So it's telling us our next step. Click to add fields to this display. We're not interested in anything in the comments section. We are interested in node parts. Now, this is something that is confusing about Drupal. The content type, you would think that those fields would be here under node because they're attached to the node, but they're not. They're, they're under content. And in addition to your content, there's going to, or for your content type of interest, there's going to be fields for every piece of content. So if you had a blog content type that defined, say, original author or original citation, then that would show up in this list. And you'd have to be careful not to select that because Drupal, or rather, Views isn't smart enough to, um, to not tell you that field is available. <laughs> so you have to go that step further and know that the blog original citation isn't going to be associated with your content type. Now, the reason it shows you that information is technical. And it's OK that it's there, because there are times you need it to be there. So, uh, And I'll show you an example of why. So let's go ahead and add, um, we only want the image. And we want the, oops, we want the node title. I didn't want that. Node title. And for the heck of it, let's just go ahead and add the node body, but we're going to limit it. So I just clicked three different items. And now it's going to give me the option to configure specifics on each one of them. So first was the image. They're in alphabetical. So first was the image. Um, it's asking, do I want it to be labeled? No, I don't want a label to appear about it. Format. Let's go ahead and use my, um, my image cache preset. We'll use that 100 by 100. I can have it linked to the node. Sure, why not? So save that. Now it's the body text. Again, don't want the label. Or you know, I'll add the label in just so you can see it. Uh, however, the body text can be something like 400 uh, characters. We don't want to necessarily display all that. Let's trim that down to 50. There's our, you can have it so it trims only on word boundaries up to 50. You can add an ellipsis at the end of the text. You can strip all the HTML out of it. Or if you click this, it's supposed to close all HTML tags that would normally have been left open if it clipped on the 50 character limit. In my experience, this this thing isn't as smart as it claims. So I just come up with alternative solutions, either strip the HTML or deliver the content some other way. The reason being is you don't want it to accidentally break on a production site. Because if there's one errant div, as you've seen, the entire theme can go all wonky. All right. All right, so that's all those. And there's our first example layout. Now this is, um, this is the standard default dump, which means it's unformatted. Um, we're not going to tweak this anymore. So let's go ahead and change the style. Let's have it display as a table. You can ignore these. They're warnings. You wouldn't normally see these. Um, so now we've got them displaying as a table. Image, description, title. Uh, one of the things I don't like about this is I like the description to come after the title. So let's change the order of the fields. And then I also want that title to link to the node when they click on it. Poof. So we've managed to create a, 
a usable display of this content in about five minutes. So now we're, um, we're down to the point where we have to decide how we wanna, where we wanna put this uh, display. Do we wanna put it in a block so we can place it somewhere on the page? Do we want it to be its own separate page or do we wanna use it within panels? Well, let's start with creating a page. So I left it on page, clicked Add Display. If I were to try to save now, Drupal will complain. Hey, there's no path. See, it's being helpful. So we'll click on page, add a path. Let's make it so that we can see this. Our, um, what did I call these? Window pane archive. All right, and it has the option to add it to a menu here. Uh, you have more flexibility if you add it to the menu yourself rather than leaving it in the view. But if you want to, you can add it to a menu from here. So you would choose this and then choose the menu you want it to appear in. The reason I don't like to do it is that you specify a weight via number and you have no idea what the rest of the menu looks like. And this is now stored in a feature. So every time you enable the feature, it's gonna go right back to where it was. Which, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It just rarely is the use case I want. Um, let's go ahead and add a pager since we have more than 10 items. And let's make it so that it uses Ajax so it doesn't refresh the page. Now you'll notice this thing here over on the right says override. I'll go ahead and explain what that is later. Let's add a block display. We're gonna call this block list panes block. That's just what's going to appear in here. If we want, what we want to appear in the block listings Oops, not admin panes. Exactly, that's the point I was trying to get across. Now you can see we started by setting the defaults for this view. We filtered by the node type or the content type of interest. We added the fields we wanted to use, and now we're displaying it two different ways. We display it as a page. We display it as a block. Now, because um, it relies on the defaults for a lot of these parameters. If I wanted to update both the page and the block display, I can do it from this default and it affects both of them. I don't have to go in and modify. Now that said, I told you just a second ago that I was going to um, maybe throw a monkey wrench in here. Uh, for the block display, because it has a smaller amount of space, we're gonna override the defaults and we're gonna limit it to maybe 15 characters. So if you're looking at the block, you get less text. And there you go. Because it blocks on word boundary, it's probably clipping all the way down to nothing. <clears throat> um, so now if you view the block, you get that. If you view the page, you get the larger text. That's the, that's the significance of that override and use default uh, button. Now, um, this is just an aside, a non sequitur really, but if you ever get into the, something where you you click something and it takes you to a different page. You're like, oh no, I lost my view. And you hit the back button and it's all boogered up. You just hit control R and watch it make a liar out of me. And all your changes are still there. Please still be there. Yes, they're still there. <laughs> um, and that comes in handy because uh, you'll accidentally click those links several times a day. Just saying. Um, so we'll go ahead and save that. Now, what did we call it? The page? Our window pane archive. We go to that page, poof, there is our view with all of our content displayed the way we preferred to do it. Uh, if you're using a theme that provides it, you'll have these little links that you can edit the view in context. So when you see a view you want to edit, you just click there, it takes you right to it. Um, let's go one more step. Let's take our block that we created, list window panes. Let's put it in the left sidebar. And there, it's a little wide. So you might create a different image cache profile, override the image display to see how to use that different one. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull this back out. So um, if you've been following along, you know I've wanted to introduce panels next. And you might ask yourself, what's, what advantage does panels provide over the block system? Why would I, why would I want to introduce yet another module that has a fair, fairly large learning curve already? Um, there, there are a couple of limitations to, to blocks. 
One is, um, these are the visibility settings you have access to. If you want to do something that isn't explicitly listed here, you're going to have to resort to PHP. Um, PHP isn't the end of the world, but uh, it's not, um, if there's a new module that comes out that uh, invalidates the way that you access the table or you're pulling data from a module that changes the way it stores its data, your PHP is broken. If you rely on panels to provide that same functionality, it's panels' responsibility, not yours. And I love giving other people responsibilities. <laughs> or more specifically, getting rid of responsibilities. Um, the other thing about blocks is that uh, we've got this window pane block. We can only place that in one region. That's not that big of a limitation, you would think. But what if we wanted it on, on one page to appear in the right sidebar, but on a different page to appear in the left sidebar? Using the block system, you'd have to clone the display for the view. Uh, and then you'd have to create two blocks, and you'd have to place them separately, and you'd have to set the settings for each of them. So you can see how that quickly can become a little bit of a maintenance thing. What Panels allows you to do is it allows you to place blocks wherever you like, multiple times on, in, on a single page, though it's hard to imagine a good reason to do that. Uh, and it allows you to feed information to the, the block. So one of the things that we might be interested in doing, do, do, let's look at our views. is adding the ability to search uh, by title. So I'm going to add another node title filter. And uh, so you already know how the filters work. The filters limit the content you get back. Well, that's great for me to have that ability. But what if I want to give it to the user? That gives us, Views gives us a nice little button here. Expose. Poof. Now, hold on. Should have done it differently. Now you got this nice little box here. Is it set up for ADX? Yeah. And so now we can search dynamically for all the content on the basis of that filter that you just provided. So the nice thing about that is that um, you can now give users what seems like enterprise class functionality with a couple of quick clicks. There is, um, uh, there is an, an additional, and I hope I'm not confusing things here, um, thing you can do. So for example, if we're looking at this page, where is it? Exposed form and block. Yes, OK. This um, filter here, is that it's attached to the view. You have the ability to remove it as, a, as an attachment to the view and a, create a block. Well, maybe it's best just to show you what it does. So you'll notice that the filter is no longer there. But we now have a new block called Exposed, window fame, exposed Form Window Pane. So we're actually using the one for the page. Let's put it in the sidebar. So now we're on the blocks page, but I have the ability to search the titles here. And when I hit enter, it's going to take me to this, filtered. So now you can put that in the header, the footer, the sidebar. You can hide it and let the themer put it wherever they'd like. Um, the other thing that's nice about this, and again, I'm going a little bit off into the advanced realm, is that this is just a form. So you can generate your own form, or you can override this form with hook form alter, like we discussed earlier. So that instead of having a search title here, it has a drop-down list, or it pulls from context, or it shows you something dynamic that you're, not, you know, you're inter more interested in seeing. All right, so now let's talk about panels. Let's see, what's the best way to just show a panel? I'll create a panel page. Um, do, 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 do. 
selection rules, contacts. <clears throat> so um, when you're creating the panel, you just saw that I, I did jump through that. I shouldn't have probably done that. Let me go back. This is uh, administrator title, how it appears in the list of panels. This is the machine name, which uh, you guys are growing accustomed to ignoring, but make sure it's unique. Uh, administrative description, creative description is uh, to give you an idea. It's not shown to the user, so it's only shown for you. The path is where this panel shows up. It's effectively a page. Uh, it's possible also to create blocks using panels. <clears throat> you can make this site your home page so that the panel that they land on is, uh, or the site the page they land on is this panel. And the reasons you might do this will become apparent pretty soon. Uh, optional features, there's no harm in enabling these. You can enable them all if you want. I don't. There, it's just they'll give you more criteria to select. So um, access control. Uh, you can make it so that this page is only accessible if they meet certain um, criteria. So for example, they must have authenticated role. We're not going to do that yet. We're going to do it in the selection context. Uh, the difference between selection, let me get there. This tells us whether or not the person has access to view the page. Um, we're not going to make it th difficult for them to access the page. So you know, I'm just going to create a first variant. Context. We're going to pull a context, which is the logged in user. And don't worry, I'll come back and explain what all this is. And here's the layout editor. We can use one of the default layouts. Or we can use the builder so we can create our own. I'll create the, use the builder just to show you how it works. Um, magic. And most of the instructions are actually on these pages that I'm clicking through. So don't feel intimidated that there's a lot to be clicking through. Add a region to the right. Fluid. So now, you saw how the theming worked in the last session. You were able to define regions within the template files. Panels does it differently. You define regions with this uh, click and point editor. You don't have to do this. You can use the default theme content areas. Um, but this gives the architect the flexibility to define their layouts uh, per the um, wireframes that were being given. Um, that said, you know, the designers don't always like this because they define a block width and you make the region too small to handle their blocks and now they have to go back and do extra work. So I'll save that. I'm going to reuse that layout. We're going to call it my layout. All right, so now we're to the point where we define what content goes into these regions. We are interested in the, um, the blocks that we created through the views. So let's go ahead and do that. Again, don't have to change any of that. Just for heck of it, let's go ahead and add some content here. Let's add who's online. All right, and I'm going to add a variant. Again, don't worry about it. I'm going to come back and explain what I've all done.
All right, so we've got now two variants, the panel, the original variant that we created, and the new one I just created. We want to create a, um, a view of this page that when you're not logged in, you see text that says you need to log into the site in order to view this content. And we want uh, the other one to show the content of the most recently viewed panes and that who's online block. So we have for this panel page two variants. We'll make this one that contains our content already. Require that the user be authenticated. So because this is a different variant, I have the ability to add whatever content I want here. So I'm going to add a custom content. So what did I call the page? Magic. And there is our logged in version of the page. And here's another trick that you guys might use. Instead of launching another browser, you can launch the incognito version of the browser. And because it doesn't share cookies, you can log into the same site again. Oh, that's no good. Why would it do that? Do you love the difference between practice and uh, demo? Well, maybe it's confused about logged in user. should be fine. <laughs> no, it's the same URL. The, what, it does, what Panels does is it, um, based on the selection criteria, it shows the panel that matches the best. So um, I'm not sure what's, maybe I set something in Access. But that's the reason you'd use panels, is because from the same URL, you'd be able to provide different content based on context. So, oh, you were smarter than me. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it wasn't me. <laughs> all right, well, there you go. Um, you can see that the panel um, displays content differently based on whether you're logged in or not. So it goes much, much farther than that. So now I did go through this pretty quickly. I want to go ahead and back up. Now that you know what it does, let me show you how it's doing it. This is, this was a panel page I created. It's called uh, Authentication Dependent Panel. I set a path of slash magic so that you could access it via the URL magic. Um, you could do anything there, and you can even use um, uh, uh, percent symbols. And the reason you do that is that whatever is typed after magic, say it was magic slash percent, magic slash five, that five would be available to you as a context that you could now use to um, as a selection rule. So if somebody went to select magic slash five, you could create a panel variant that was only visible to them. So it would be like a hidden something. More realistically, what you would use that for is an argument to a view. So what's an argument to a view? <clears throat> Let's say that in addition to providing that filter, we want them to specify via the URL um, a search term. So let's go ahead and do that. Do, do, 
do, do, do. Let's see, is that the best way to do that? I've never actually done it on title. I'm worried that it's going to want me to provide the entire one. Let's just do it by one. So now, because I haven't specified a letter, it won't show anything. Now it'll only show stuff starting with A. Now it'll only show stuff starting with B. So instead of using a filter to specify um, how I filter the content. I'm using an argument to specify how I filter the content. Does that make sense, what I just did there? So arguments are the same as a filter. Uh, you use glossary mode and specify how many characters. Yeah, This is useful for when you're creating an alpha list. Yeah, So you, what you do is you put the alpha list HTML in the, in the header for the table. <coughs> um, so where was I? Uh, you also notice that the title of the page changes depending upon what you've typed here. So a uh, argument is the same as a filter in terms of what it does to the content when it's displaying it. The difference is where that filter comes from. Filters are either explicitly provided or have a, a user interface element for you to provide the information. Arguments come from the URL or from context. So um, we just added an argument for the first letter that comes from here. Uh, let's see. That's not a good example. How am I on time? Oh, well, I'm on 10 minutes from it. I told you guys I'd finish early. Um, I'm going to wrap up then. Any questions? <laughs> yeah, before we get to the hard stuff, <laughs> there is. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so let's see here. This is the layout, and the layout is variant on a per variant basis. So one variant can look one way and have you know several columns. The other variant can have a, uh, just the one. All right. So I've already set this um, type, so I'm actually going to have to change the layout entirely. So you, if you want to build your own, choose builders. Oops. And it's because I'm changing the table or the layout, and because there's already content there, it's asking me where to move the existing content. If you were creating a panel from scratch, you wouldn't have this step. Okay. So now, um, if you have leave layout flexible as an option, I would still have this button, but. And as a builder, you have this button. You click this. It gives you the ability to add region to the left. Let's add another row. And so you can add as many as you like. You can um, change the widths, the heights, and the entire structure of it. Um, I personally, I mean, I don't know that there's a whole lot of use for this. I think that the theme of tends to provide you with what you need most of the time. But if you need the ability to modify it, you have that right there. So, or they'll provide you with a layout they prefer you to use, and you just choose it from the list they give you. Do you, do you use sub-panels? Yeah, mini-panels is something I would love to talk about. But um, to really get the concept across, it takes a little bit. So you saw what panels do. I mean, you can provide them with context, and they can change what they show based on that context. Many panels work exactly the same way. You can provide them context, they show you different information. So why that extra level of abstraction? Well, there might be things like, for example, a sidebar that contains the user profile picture, uh, the last time they logged in, and who else is logged in. And those are three blocks that you don't want to have to add to every panel variant that you do. So you create a mini panel and include that on every panel that you create. 
those mini panels are also available as blocks, so you can use it with the traditional block system. See? So um, now the last thing about blocks versus panels and the big raging war and debate is that um, features does not store blocks, at least not without a, a helper module that only barely does the job. So if you want to package up layouts, you can't do it with blocks. Uh, you'd have to write a module that handles the block placements. Panels are exportable through features. Uh, are they? Yeah, through features. So you can export an entire panel with its layout, with all of the contents and all the views associated with it, all as a single feature. And the utility of that comes from the fact that, say, that you've got a panel that defines, again, say, a blog. It has a blog header, blog archive, a um, last five posts, and um, submit a new post. And that's all part of a single panel that you've created. That is now a single exportable that you create as a feature, and you can roll that out to as many sites as you like. And then down the line, if you discover that um, you made a mistake and that the archive is now listing them in reverse order instead of you know, chronological, then you update the feature, it automatically rolls out to all of the sites that use it. Um, further, if you keep the feature in your Git repo, you can have multiple branches available and you know, keep track of them that way. Um, what else is there that Panels does? There are a lot of things that Panels does that I just, I'm just scratching the surface for you. Um, I showed you how you can use an argument with views. Panels can feed those arguments without them having to be present in the URL. So if you were through Panels to pull in some um, taxonomy term that's associated with a node, then you can use that taxonomy term as an argument without it being explicitly present in the URL. So that's useful for things like, I'm looking at uh, a particular region, and I want to see houses that are in that region. The houses in that region are tagged with a taxonomy term that's the same as the region. So now you can pull them up based on the related information but, so, um, without having to do a complicated nested view or something like that. Is that making sense? So I'm sorry if that you know, is you know, straightforward, 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 and then whoa. But uh, if you guys have any questions, yeah. Was that one better than the module div? <laughs> well, good. Well, I hope you guys got something out of this. Um, I am available for at least a little while, and then I have to long three-hour drive home. So please take advantage of my time if you, if you feel like you can. Um, thanks. Uh, again, appreciate you guys coming out. An OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices. HP Slate and WebOS. HP. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you.